Hi everyone, welcome back to Farron and Film, and we are back with part two of our top ten trilogies. We've done ten to six uh, last time or last week, whenever it is that this was released, probably last week now. Um, I'm going to kick us off with my number five, mainly because I thought I was going to be the one to deliver the hot take first, but Sam beat me to it at the end of his part two. My number five is Lord of the Rings. Oh my God. Um, now... <laughs> I'm covering Mary's ears so you don't have to listen to this. Now, this isn't that I don't like them. Obviously, I like them, right? Fellowship is up there as one of my favourite films of all time, right? Not in my top ten, but it's up there with one of my favourite films of all time. Like, the Helm's Deep scene in Two Towers is just phenomenal and nothing beats it. The Return of the King is too long. Like, I think I've only seen that all the way through twice. Once at the cinema and then once since. But then... It's 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 too long. It ends about forty five times. Like who's actually gonna watch the extended version because it's four hours twenty minutes long or something <laughs> like that? I know Michael's done it because you went to the cinema, didn't you? Didn't you do them like week yeah. after week? I did indeed. It's just it's yeah. too like, with with no intermission as well. With no intermission because I'm strong too enough. Long. <laughs> yeah. That's too literally, long. Literally like like two months ago we did this. Yeah. See, no, I just can't. Like, the story across all three films is, to me, what got it on the list anyway. Um, And I think originally it was probably my number two. Then it went to three. And then when I had a look again at my list last night, it dropped to five. So you're probably not going to agree with the stuff that I've got above it. But realistically, I'm looking at how much I enjoy all three films. And I love the first. The second one's really good. The third is good, but it, it peters off. So, and I spoke to my father-in-law on Boxing Day and he said, are you doing anything for the podcast over Christmas? And I said, yeah, we're doing top 10 trilogies. And he said, well, there's only one right answer and it's Lord of the Rings. And he's always said that to me. And mm-hmm. sorry, Dave, if you're listening, but it's number five. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, who's next? I've already crossed it off. Uh, Michael, number five. Um, I went with, for number five, OG Star Wars. So original. Yeah. See now, he thinks that's too. <laughs> See, well, th- th- this is my this is my only Star Wars because I kind of went with I didn't want to put multiple because I probably would have prequels in there as well. Sequels just because of the third I couldn't have them in. Um, prequels are enjoyable. Oh, as in, they came out when I was young <laughs> and I hadn't actually seen the original trilogy yet, so I saw the prequels first. Um, because no one in my family was into this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, I remember going back and watching it, and just the storytelling's better, the characters are better. Um, I was, I remember being really annoyed at the the lightsaber fights. Yeah, I guess. as I got older, I kind of I appreciate them for what they were at the time now, so they don't bother me as much. But yeah, when you'd seen like. Quiage gone and Obi Wan take on Darth Maul. Yeah, when you've seen Duel of the Face, two ben old men playing to see each other is a bit. Yeah. It's and even more broken by Obi Wan because that fight in Obi Wan is probably the best lightsaber fight of any lightsaber fight. And then yeah, no, like, Obi Wan's which... hallway scene is like two days before that. Yeah, he's just <laughs> just messing up rebels for fun. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it is just, and I think there's there's not really many low points in it, and I think most of the issues people do have with it are explained in universe. You know, like, well, why is the Death Star got a weakness? Well, it didn't. They didn't expect a space wizard to attack yeah. it with his space wizard powers because yeah. all the computers failed and their space wizard attacked it. You know, and you can't plan for space wizards. You can't. They thought they were extinct. And they literally do it in like the next time they build a Death Star, they don't just have like one port. They have lots of little. And everyone's like, "Oh, why did they have convenient ship-sized holes in it? Because it wasn't finished being built, guys. That's why." <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I just think, and also that is the one that spawned the whole universe. And when you consider that it started because he wanted to make Dune and couldn't, you know. Like, look how great that like extended universe has become. And obviously, mm. we've got Boba Fett, who is probably the greatest Star Wars character of all time, other than Darth Vader. Or is it? That's you can pull your face. Now, That's not a hot, hot take. take. <laughs> not a hot take. There is no one cooler looking than Boba Fett. Yeah, you didn't, say, you didn't say that. You didn't say that. You said 
Well, Mandalorian. I mean, like, I mean, like iconic. You know, like Darth Vader is iconic. Yeah. Um, in fact, I worry he's going to get overused because they know he's iconic, and if he's on screen, he's got presence, and we'll lose that. Um, but yeah, it just spawns so many great kind of characters that persist to today. I'm not worried about them overusing it. Like one thing that Disney people seem to agree on, because some people love Disney Star Wars, some people hate it, but people seem to agree that Disney seem to understand Vader and what makes Vader good. Like whenever Disney have done Vader, he's been phenomenal. <laughs> like, and like in the um, in the EA games recently, like Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor, Vader's been phenomenal he's been so good yeah the, the fact that he's like you just have to survive him just run the end, <laughs> you can't so do anything good. just run <laughs> which even just from like a gameplay is to, to have a boss like that and he's probably one of the only characters you can really pull that off with yeah because you see him come out and you're like there's no way i'm beating darth vader that can't happen mm. and then you get this amazing like yeah this amazing runaway scene Sam, number five. So my number five is, I don't think many of you would have seen the third one because it only came out this year, but it's the Equalizer trilogy. Ooh. So okay. obviously I'm a massive fan of Denzel Washington. Um, I can't rate him enough. So he had to get in there somewhere and this trilogy kind of makes it off in times of where it is at. I think most of us probably seen the first one. The, what the the kind of end scene kind of in the supermarket is is phenomenal it's 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 very very gory it's actually lovely to watch in, in parts of like how it's done i feel like number two kind of follows on from the very same theme it's just him trying to have a nice peaceful life he fakes his own death in number one and tries to just live a peaceful life and then from there on he's just trying to constantly go out and kind of Revenge for people that he actually doesn't know anything about. Number two kind of ties that a little bit more. He actually, I think people start coming for him in terms of kind of the, the kind of the callback to number one, and he kind of gets in contact with kind of his old friends and stuff. And then number three this year, he's in a completely different city, he's in like a different country, and again, he's just trying to live a peaceful life. It's the same theme all the way through, but it's just done very, very well. And this kind of like a little nod in number three to kind of number one, and number two. Um, it doesn't go, it's not, it's not like this massive, amazing kind of film franchise that you would expect, but it's just not three nice films to watch back to back, and it does exactly what it wants. It's probably smarter than John Wick in the way it executes yeah. things. It's very kind of the same vein, but it's a lot smarter in what it does. Um, so yeah, number five is the equalizer. I love that bit in number three where he's just like following like the capos in his like silk pajamas, and he's like slowly leaving his house and he's just like calmly following him yeah. it is horrifying my only complaint my only real complaint with the equalizer is that pedro pascal has to have a naked upper lip in the second one yeah. that's that's not okay he need he needs his facial hair other than that <laughs> i suppose like yeah the, the thing like that is it's clearly artistic isn't it and i think that kind of rings through in a lot of us it's like he's <laughs> like obsessed with time and stuff and he's always got his watch on he's yeah i think it's, it's just it's just a good just a three little films. Is, is, it equal, is it one of the Equalizer films where he really casually like disarms a guy and holds the gun at him? Like in the middle of a threat down? Yeah, always. Like, just like claps and he has yeah. the gun and then he's like, you're going you're, you're gonna to you're you're tell your men to put the guns down because they're going to listen to you, aren't they? Yeah. In a performance that like you kind of, because I love Denzel Washington. I love the way he just delivers lines. They just sound like he has a real gravitas that I don't feel like a lot of American actors have. Like, I would trust him with Shakespeare. Like, he's that kind of performer. Oh, he did it. Really. He's in Shakespeare, isn't he? So. Yeah, he did it. Is he a fellow? No, he didn't. Tried to do him at best. Ooh. For, I need to find that. I need to find that. Find that. That'd be good. Uh, right. Ollie, number five. Um, I have only seen each of these films once, and it is one of those, every time I think back on them, it's like, Jesus, those films had no right being anywhere near as good as they were. And they were phenomenal. Uh, it's the Planet of the Apes trilogy. Rise, Dawn, War. Did anybody here expect those films to be that good? Like, you, you no, thought you, you knew that they were going to reboot Planet of the Apes. It was like some weird prequel, and James Franco was the lead person in it. And everyone probably thought, oh, here we go. 
But Andy Circus being Andy Circus just gives us one of the performances of the decade as Caesar throughout those three th- films. Um, and again, it's one of, like I said, I have only seen them once, but they are all just such good films. The plot is so tight, there is no fact on any of the writing. Um, the effects are outstanding. You really feel for these like apes, like they really man- they weirdly manage to humanize them. Um, weirdly good casts in all of them as well. Like, um, like I love Gary Oldman in the second one. I love John Lithgow being dead confused. Mal J- Draco Malfoy getting a real, you know, getting to cheesily do the iconic line, get your damn paws off me, you damn dirty ape. And then Caesar going, no, just silence in the cinema. You were like, oh, that's not okay. Um, I remember watching Dawn in the cinema. Uh, Toby Kebbell as Kuba. Fantastic villain performance. I've just remembered that. Maybe have to consider it for my list. Um, and then War of the Planet. Just a really tight story all the way through. The effects are stunning to this day. It's it's just it's it's a brilliant performance as well. I've already said by Andy Circus. Like the evolution of Caesar as it goes on, and the way he gets that bit more intelligent, and the way he you understand where the legend of Caesar comes from in the original films, which is really, really, and the way they wove that into the narrative is just really clever. Um, and I need to go back and watch them all again. They are outstanding films. They are. They are. They're really good. Is it Matt Reeves who directed Matt Reeves them? did the second two. He did one, uh, Dawn and War. Yeah. Um, and just... And... And what he did with Batman. So Yeah, I was about to say, it feels like... It, like it feels like Batman was his reward for doing so well on <laughs> on an IP that really should not have done as well as it should as it did. Yeah. Uh, right, number fours, Michael. If you want to kick us off with number four. Yeah, it's already been up this one. Everything's pretty much already been said. Uh, though I put it higher up. Spider Man Raimi trilogy. Wow. Um, and I think just because this was the first, I was never really into comics and stuff. And this was the film that did it. This was the film that really got me into it. So this started off everything in that kind of genre for me. Um, and I remember like no one I knew liked it. Like everyone I knew just liked horror movies and action movies. And it just kind of started this kind of, um, oh, maybe he's getting, well, he wants to go. Spider-Man, the first um, Spider-Man was both. It's an action movie and a horror movie. Like it's terrifying. <laughs> I mean, the the second Spider Man with the Doc Ock bit and the chainsaw. Oh God! And I I think this is the case. It was kind of like, and I think for a lot of people, it's like it's okay to like these things now. You know, you can like actually these things can be quite cool, and you can like them. And I think for me, it had always been like, oh, that's that's like stuff I'm not into. And then it was like it started this whole kind of entire like the MCU. I would have probably never watched the MCU even if it had been made. Without this, I'd have been one of the six people in the world who haven't watched it all. Um, so there'd be seven of us. Um, so yeah, it just it had to go quite high for me. Nice. I feel lucky that I experienced it differently. Then I don't know anybody who didn't like this within my social circles. Like people loved Spider Man. You had terrible friends, Michael. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> The, I to be fair, think... that is no longer my social circle, so maybe that's yeah. It says maybe a lot. Spider Man was the the start of the rift drove us apart. <laughs> <laughs> Spider Man's the one that I think really kicked off the boom. Whereas I think a lot of people forget about X Men just before it. Um, like I love I think, the X Men films. I do. They were in my honorable mentions. I think the thing that made me go with Spider Man ahead of them was that Spider Man kind of had the balls to go a bit more comic book accurate with the costumes. Mm-hmm. Like, I still don't think the Tobey Maguire Spider Man suit has been topped. No. Like, that is still the best Spider Man suit in film. Whereas the X Men, like, they literally make fun 
of the costumes in the X-Men films, like Wolverine's like, oh, you go out in these, and Cyclops is like, well, what would you prefer, yellow spandex? Get it? Because he, he wears yellow spandex in the comics, yeah? You wear uh-huh. Deadpool 3. I've seen from the Daredevil set photos, he looks good in it. Mm. He looks fantastic in it, so... Fun thing, have you seen the deleted? Have you seen like the like outtake in the Statue of Liberty scene in X Men where Spider Man kind of runs up behind them, like coming to help them with their problem? Yeah, it's just a <laughs> random guy in a Spider Man suit. Yeah, it's just some random guy in a Spider Man suit. Oh, just runs up film, like, and then runs what? away. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sammy, number four. So number four, I suppose. Again, I think a lot of probably my last MCU entry is uh, now at number four. And again, it's Guardians of the Galaxy. So, balls. Like, I've I feel like audience. this is the best <laughs> MCU trilogy all the way through. I think it's 100% sets itself apart from the kind of MCU art just purely because it's not set on Earth. It's like set away from here for the majority of it. There's that little part, obviously, in number two. And we obviously have a little part in the moon where it starts off. But the vast majority of it is kind of is away from us, so it's it is definitely separate. Um, the soundtrack again, a little nod to the sound. The soundtrack is is great throughout. Um, so it kind of gets that. I think the first couple of scenes in Volume One definitely give Star Wars vibes. Like I remember sitting there and thinking, I've not got much time for this film. I didn't went in there really unexpected, and then it, yeah, it just give off Star Wars vibes from from the outtake. Um, it's consistently funny throughout all three films. Um, number two for me is where it dips a little bit. I just don't get Igor as a bad I just don't just don't kind of get that vibe of like the entire planet's in. I just it just doesn't sit well with me. But again, apart from that, the prison scene with Baby Groot and kind of that kind of exploration of kind of like that little character developing is kind of just it's just it's just it's just a very nice film. A little nod to Xandar and Mary Poppins. That's obviously very, very touching in number two. And then number three. Again, it only came out this year. I've just rewatched it recently. Um, and again, it's just such an end to the trilogy, I suppose. I forgot about Guardians. I forgot it had a third film out and I forgot how much I loved the first film. <laughs> I love the first one. It's not on my list. Um, I, I, I think you're right in that I, I feel like two does drop. Um I, I, don't, I wasn't that big of a fan of three as everyone else seems to be. I loved three. I loved the high evolutionary. He's such an interesting concept of a villain of like someone playing God and just being so cavalier with life. Like just really horrifying. A great over the top performance as well. Like proper Tim Curry levels of performance. Like it's brilliant. And just the scenes with Rocket and his friends are just heartbreaking. <laughs> They're not okay. They're you know like, where I'm, it's going. yeah, I, yeah. I, you know where it's going, but I don't think I've emotionally recovered from yeah. ground. They're just building and... you up, and you know they're building you up to hurt you. Yeah, to and Lila and Teeth and ground. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ollie, your number four. Uh, my number four is George's fault for two reasons. Uh, it's her fault because she reminded me of this when I already had a pretty, pretty settled list. Uh, it's also her fault because I've talked about it again and again as being one of those series of films where I wouldn't have watched them without her. I was like, no, that sounds horrible. And she was like, no, seriously, actually watch it. And then I watched it and was like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. Um, and we've already hinted at certain trilogies that will no longer be a trilogy within a year. Have you figured it out yet, Adam? I'm assuming it's Kung Fu Panda. It is Kung Fu Panda. Again, like similar to Planet of the Apes, except I love it a lot more and have watched it a lot more. This IP has no right, absolutely no right, being as good as it is. It's a Kung Fu Panda. Exactly. It should be absolute garbage tier, bottom of the barrel level kids entertainment from DreamWorks, desperately trying to cash in on um, the kind of cutesy stuff that Disney make. But no, they fully embrace and um, explore culture within martial arts and introduce, like, it is very babies level entry in the way that Barbie is quite babies level feminism. But a lot of people, frankly, need that. A lot of people haven't been introduced to these concepts at all. And having any film that can kind of make it easy to grasp and understand 
is a, is brilliant. The fight scenes in all the Kung Fu Panda films thus far are some of the best fight scenes I've seen in animation, and that includes stuff that is geared towards it, like Dragon Ball Z. Like... There is a lot of stuff in this that would give Dragon Ball Z fights a run for their money, other than the fact that they don't like shoot beams at each other until the very end of Kung Fu Panda 3. Um, and like all the villains are just really interesting as well. Like Tai Lung, who I think is one of the weaker ones just from his vocal performance, but I love his backstory of he was the Mac, he was Shifu's original student and he turned bad because he wasn't part of a prophecy. Um, and uh, Kai in the third film again a little bit weak but J.K. Simmons as a villain is always going to be great but Lord Shen who managed to make Peacock intimidating Intimidating. Peacocks are not scary this one is he has like feather daggers and he has Gary Oldman's voice and he has psychological hold over our main hero and like that look into his backstory when he accepts his past and he's like having in peace and he's doing the whole thing of like making moving the raindrop across him as he like relives his trauma through like a different animation style just again zero right for these films to be as emotionally hard hitting as they are the cast is phenomenal the jokes pretty much always land like they're very funny films but they're very heart rendering films when they want to be as well um I just, I cannot think of anything wrong with them. They're such good films. And this is the reason I don't have How to Train Your Dragon in there as a trilogy. Because I think How to Train Your Dragon probably has a better story insofar as it has definitively ended. And it's a nice, like, it has a really nice ending to it. Whereas, as we've seen with this, this could just kind of keep on going. And because it's clearly a bit of a money spinner for DreamWorks, I worry that they are just going to beat this franchise to death. Um, but I am optimistic for the next, because like, the trailers are always terrible for these films. They always angle towards kids. And then when you actually get in there, it is something a bit deeper. It is something with a bit more weight to it. But we've got Viola Davis as a villain in the next film, so I am hyped. Um, I'm not looking forward to Aquafina doing her Aquafina shtick again. Like, I like Aquafina, but it's a lot. <laughs> Currently, there is a lot of Aquafina out there just kind of doing the same thing again and again. But, I'd yeah. have to Toy Story 4, though, couldn't you? So. Mm. True. Yeah, um... I, I, I nearly did just kind of... Imp- and I think Adam would have accepted it. I nearly put Toy Story as a protest. I would like have just... Story. I would have accepted it so I could ignore 4. Exactly. Like, because yeah. that, that's what I've done with a number of them. Like... With Indiana Jones, I've ignored four and five. Just I've ignored it because they're they're not the same. They're not they're just not the same. There's very <laughs> like, different lists if we could do that. Yeah. We could ignore I, the I dodgy ignored. fourth one. I, I I'm gonna do that with the next one, and I don't care how annoyed it makes uh, anyone, really. Well, I'm ignoring a terrible like following entry on from the trilogy. Whatever. Uh, but yeah, Kung Fu Panda number four. <laughs> Okay, look. Uh, right, my number four, uh, another MCU ent- entry. I don't think it's actually made anyone's list yet. Um, Captain America. Like, it nearly did, to be fair. Just, it was so close. Absolute. And me and you have done this on the on the tier list, Ollie. Like, First Avenger is fine. Like, yeah. it's not groundbreaking at all. I struggle, as we all know, with period films as it is. Like, mm. any film that's set, World War Two time or whatever, I just struggle to engage with. Um, it is the second best film of that uh, phase. phase. Um, I'm not including Avengers as a phase. Oh, as part of the phase. No, it's not. No, it's not. Yeah, no, it's not. So Iron Man's the best. Thor is the second best. Mm, no, nah, I prefer this. I do prefer nah, this. It's nah. it's tight. Like, I like Thor, but it's funnier than this. But like, I I do. I, I get. I think the first one just gets beat with the stick that it's not as good as Iron Man, which I don't think is as, is fair as a criticism. Yeah, um, there's nothing but, wrong with Captain uh, First Avenger. There's nothing wrong with it. But Winter Soldier and Civil War are top tier. Yeah, to you, like you, you don't get much better than those two films. Like Winter Soldier as a sort of standalone surprise, not even standalone, but as a surprise. Like going into Winter Soldier, I didn't expect it to be anywhere as good as it was. Yeah, and it just it blew me away. The only my only criticism of Winter Soldier is Bucky seemed signposted 
really obviously. And then when yeah. he took his mask off, it was supposed to be, to be like, fair, a, oh my God, it's Bucky. To be fair, though, anybody who's read the comics knew that was Well, comic. yeah, yeah. So it was a bit weird that they still even bothered going down that route. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Civil War, or, you know, Age of Ultron 2.5. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was just Avengers, yeah. Fun. Yeah, Avengers two and a half. Yeah, yeah just phenomenal. Absolutely. I think phenomenal. that is the only reason I didn't include it on here is that, like Michael kind of mentioned it, it doesn't feel like the Captain America story so much. Yeah, because like, because you could be like, oh, Captain America, Infinity War, Captain America, and you can put Captain America in front of anything. Yeah, you know, that is very much an ensemble film. Yeah. Um. It. I mean. I. I like. I accept it as a trilogy in the sense that it is meant yeah. to be a trilogy, but they did make it like it's Spider Man's introduction. Yeah. Uh. You know. I would say Tony Stark and Iron Man. Black Panther's introduction character. as well. It is Black Panther's introduction. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. As I mean, they're just. I don't know. I just feel like because if you take Iron Man out of that film, a lot of the emotional weight is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and so it's kind of like. It, it could have been it's Captain America to... versus Iron Man, couldn't it? You know, yeah, yeah, and like, yeah, I do, I do feel like because Civil War was obviously such a big deal in the comic run, mm. like that's huge, and it doesn't really go anywhere. They don't give it the time to have like these two. Like, it would have been nice to really sit with that and like leave off Avengers for a bit, like just let there be these two opposing sides of the heroes' forces and see the chaos that that causes. And they like, do it a little bit, don't they? Whereas, like, at the beginning of Infinity War, Iron Man gets his old phone out and he's like, right, I need to try and talk to Captain America now. Yeah, so there's, there's, only, there's a little it. bit of distance like, that gets created between the two, but it's never really felt in the films that go between Civil yeah, War and Infinity War. It, it doesn't feel like it's anything more than they punch for a bit and then they're mates. But I mean, I felt like the fight scene at the end of Civil War felt like one of the most visceral and intense. Oh yeah, that is a phenomenal fight scene. scene. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, like the fact that Cap is just trying to keep both of his friends alive, whilst his, those two friends are fine just killing each other. Yeah. Like that is really good. Yeah. Um, but again, like especially with the way that fight ended, a film where a whole film of that still being, like, really bad blood and festering. Like, you you could have even had, an, like, an Iron Man Civil War. You know mm. what I mean? Like, Captain yeah. America Civil War, Iron Man Civil yeah. War. Like, yeah. have that as a separate I guess they needed it to be unresolved, to have the wonder and vision needing to hide away. Because mm. they were technically on opposite sides. Yeah. yeah. And because that's why they were vulnerable, and that's why Vision got nerfed in the first... 30 seconds of his appearance on screen. Mm. He goes from like the strongest Avenger to some guy. Lying on a True, but you um, could still have that happen. You could have that happen over the course of Iron Man and Civil War if you wanted. Mm. And just I guess so, yeah, yeah. And then and you on. could even do you could even do it. It'd be quite brave to do, but you could even have it as like um one of those fil- you know, one of those crash moments of like a similar film, like even similar kind of timeline but from Iron Man's perspective and more of what he's doing and like different events that were happening around that time. Um, and you could have it, you know, just after and still some of that bad blood kind of fermenting just underneath the So I don't know, like, it sounds like I'm having a go at it. It is a phenomenal film. I just feel like it could have been an Avengers film rather than a Captain America film. Yeah, yeah. It could That's have been, it for me. but yeah. it's a Captain America film, so it's trilogy, so it's my number yeah. four. No, it is, it is. <laughs> Um, <laughs> unlike my number three but I don't care oh god well there we go Sam you want to kick us off with your number three yeah so I suppose this is probably for me one of the most defining film franchises probably ever made for me I remember when the reboot well the re- not the reboot that's the wrong word when the kind of when the reruns came out after its anniversary I think in like 96 I was on a trip to Prestatin with school it took us to the cinema and it was Star Wars episode 4 A New Hope was playing on that, and that's the first time I remember sitting. I remember the first time watching it, seeing it. Some of my friends in year six had already seen it. They're like, You're not seeing this before. I was like, Never seen this film in my life. And then from that point onwards, just that he's just obsessed with, I suppose, not maybe in, 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 in respect of like, I'm not like massively or reading all the comics and like every single person's backstory, but just pure watching the films every time they're out. I would love them. Anything like it's on Disney Plus, I would watch them. So the original Star Wars trilogy is at number three. Um, it's probably well, it's 
it's it's just iconic, isn't it, in everything that it does. For me, obviously, number three is is the weaker one of the three of them. Um, it's probably, if you list the nine, it's probably probably in the bottom half of the nine now. Uh, number three for me, just because it's it's just a rehash of number one um, in, in a lot of respects. So, but yeah, for me, it's it's phenomenal. It made me love sci-fi, I suppose, in the way that it is, the way that it's set, especially when you're an 11 year old kid watching this at the cinema for the first time. It's just it's just all the special place in your heart. And from then on, then probably every other year you just rewatch it, don't you? Like mm. there's no there's no way that you can not ever rewatch this again in your lifetime. You just constantly, yeah, we'll just put them on, we'll just put them on. And yeah, it, it's great. And obviously, like Michael's already said about Boba Fett, I think he is iconic in the way that he, he old he's obviously got that kind of what's the word that there's a word that Michael I can't think of it, and Michael certainly didn't think of it, but there's a word where a he's vibe. Like, what? A vibe and a He's he's like He's, he's 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 so big, but he's literally got oh like presence. Small, he's but he's got like the smallest kind of part in a film. He does have real presence in there. Yeah, I know what you mean. Everyone just, every, I think everyone in, in like kind of loves Boba Fett. They've made a full kind of thing from him. So yeah, so number three is my original. Nice, nice. I have nothing further to say about it at this point in time. All right, Ollie, annoy me about your number three. Uh, my number three has a fourth one that I'm going to ignore. Yeah, because I don't. It barely feels like the fourth one. It like the fourth film. I you're probably going to figure this out from our conversations on the chat. The fourth one really just feels like a weird fan fiction script. It does not feel like an act like a valid representation and continuation of the story from the first three films. I'm going with Alien. I'm going with Alien. Alien Resurrection is just weird. It's not a proper film. I don't know what Alien Resurrections is trying to do, but it is an Alien 4. I don't care what you're going to try and shake your head and sulk just, about. Just the, the, the rules have just gone. They're out the door. They've gone. Right. I have now said, I've said on the chat, I've said on here at least twice, I don't care. Oh, <laughs> it's just... my list. What's the because point? there's AVP and AVP two, you could consider Resurrection AVP. Don't and AVP enable it, Michael. To be a I'm second trilogy. No, this is what you get. <laughs> this is what you get collectively for just like having Lord of the Rings so low. Anyway, um, <laughs> I mean, you've yeah. got the Dark Knight at seven, so let's not. <laughs> You're so, Kung Fu Panda above the Dark Knight, but let's carry hey, on. Hey, Kung Fu Panda, like, more consistent than the Dark Knight, it is. Oh, oh, oh right, okay. <laughs> um, so, the first Alien film is my joint favourite horror film of all time. Uh, it's between that and The Exorcist. I've seen Alien in a cave. Uh, with Georgia, we had a screening in a cave, and that was horrifying because every little drip, drip behind you, you were convinced the xenomorph was about to pound you from behind. Um, people do argue about what's better out of Alien or Aliens. I find that kind of a redundant argument because I think they're very different films that seek to achieve very different things, and I think they are both the some of the best films at what they do. So it is literally just down to what kind of film you prefer. So... But at the same time, I don't get annoyed with anyone saying they prefer two over one or one over two. They are both phenomenal films and they are both some of the best in their genre. My One of my hot... Well, not according to Adam, based on his reaction to what I've said so far. One of my hot takes is that Alien 3 is not as bad as everyone says it is. Like, everyone treats Alien 3, including David Fincher, and I do get why, like, he was really, like... Um, hamstrung by the studio um, and you can tell like the studio's fingerprints are all over Alien 3 but I like what he was trying to do and the film that we got out of it was okay, there are some good memorable characters in the supporting cast, I like the limitation that there are no weapons so they've really got to improvise how they deal with the threat, it does feel a bit sad and scaled back that we're back to only having the one creature, but the payoff, you know, the trade-off of them not having any weapons to deal with is quite good. You've got lots of, like, good British character actors in there. So you've got, like, David Morse, Paul McGann, Charles Dance, you know, loads of, you know, really accomplished performers in this film. And Sigourney Weaver, 
you know, does really well in this film, despite having, you know, a chopped and changed script. Um, I like most of the effects in this. And, you know, her sacrifice at the end is quite an iconic moment that I do think gets overlooked because a terrible film written by Josh Whedon came along. He just wrote some fan fiction. It's like, oh, what if we cloned her and the clone had the the alien in her? No, shut up. Um, one of the best horror films ever, followed by one of the best action films ever, followed by the, the Kickstarter to David Fincher's career. Like, when you describe it in isolation like that, it is a hell of a trilogy. And yeah, it's by, it, it is probably by default David Fincher's weakest work, but I think you can see, you can still see some of his fingerprints in there. You can see the filmmaker he would go on to become. You can see his director, you can see his direction in there and you can see why he's had the career that he's had just off the back of Alien 3. It's a cracking set of films. And I'm ignoring Resurrection because it's terrible. I mean, I'm just glad that me, Michael and Sam did our top tens and you came with a top eight and two non-picks. No, so, it's my pick. Screw you. Wow. <laughs> uh, my number three has already been mentioned, but again, some of you had it too low. Um, it's the MCU Spider-Man films. <laughs> just just I love I love homecoming and no way home was like a whole other thing. It was just a cultural behemoth and being in the cinema and having people weeping and hollering and cheering. I mean, I even did a little giddy clap when Matt Murdock sat down at the coffee table. So never mind anything else that happened afterwards. But <laughs> I absolutely love these films. And I I will admit, Far From Home is the sort of dipping a little bit. Um because I think it falls into the trap of like, we've got to try and continue the MCU, you know, and it, it sort of falls into that a little bit. But I think um, as a trilogy, they all work really well. And I, I I will say this, I think Tom Holland is my favourite Spider-Man. So, you know, I know that people might disagree, but for me, he's, he's he, up there. He might be the best Spider-Man, he just isn't my favourite Peter Parker. Oh, here we go. But no, it's, it's a no, because like... you, you can do the same with Bruce Wayne and Batman. No, exactly. Happen. I was about yeah. to say, I think you can have a favorite Batman and a favorite Bruce Wayne. I don't think they need to be the same. But like, I like, I don't think Ben Affleck is going to be anyone's favorite Bruce Wayne. But I think he could be a lot of people's favorite Batman. Underrated Batman. He's a very underrated Batman, Batman. but I don't think he's a particularly good Bruce Wayne. I don't think Arpats is a particularly good Bruce Wayne, but I think he's a very good Batman. But he's a good that's that era of it's Bruce Wayne. Early, it's early, isn't it? This early, time. clearly mentally ill Bruce Wayne. He's very good at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So MCU Spider Man's my number three. I don't really have much else to say because I feel like we've covered it. Um, Michael, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is. So I'm going to ignore the next five, and I'm going to go with the first three Harry Potter films. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I, I feel like I'd, I'd ignore one and two, go for three, ignore four, five, and six, and, and then... <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't even take Deadly Hours Part 1, so... You could have the Serious Black trilogy, couldn't you? Yes. So, so he's dead. <laughs> yeah, but it contains the worst film, so that would be a rogue shower. Yeah. Goblet. Uh, but no, Goblet's uh, it is that the worst film. Goblet's the worst Goblet's film, Adam. The worst film. What's the worst film? Harry Potter Goes Camping, Deathly Hours Part 1. That's the worst film. <laughs> Nah, you get Bellatrix being fundamental in it. It's quite nah, fun. Nah. Anyway, Michael. For 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that Night Trilogy, because I do think, as much as I know we have different opinions on which film's the best, I do think like Batman Begins is a really strong start, and I've that's probably the one I've gone back and watched the most. I think it's a really good origin story to like why, how he becomes Batman, how is this billionaire become really good at fighting. And I think the whole, I know it's the League of Shadows in this, not League of Assassins, but I think, you know, bringing Raz al Ghul and doing that, he was trained with them. That's why he's so good. Um, But he isn't just like him because he has his kind of street brawler mentality from before he met them as well. Um, I do think it's one of those where, yeah, he's not necessarily a great Bruce Wayne. He's an all right Bruce Wayne. Um, I don't think anyone's got Bruce Wayne really right yet. Kevin Conroy. Um, I mean, but even that is that's a, that's just a voice. 
I'll give over. It's still acting. It's just a voice. You what can't you say that he is the best voice? Bruce Wayne because he's no, just a voice. I think the an- the animated shows do get Bruce Wayne Wayne right quite a lot, and I think because that's what I am comparing it to when I say. Um, so yeah, and I I know that it is that, but I guess the animation is part of it, isn't it? Though, so it isn't just the actor. Um, but I think it is. It's if he for a self-contained free film Batman, I think it is the best one. I know we've not really had another trilogy of Batman yet, but um, yeah, I think it's not perfect. I don't. I know we have different opinions, but I know I do like it. I think, like say, even if it was just as good as Batman Begins all the way through. It would still be a really, really good trilogy. I, I am. I mean, I'm hopeful that we're going to get a Matt Reeves trilogy. That it's not oh, just going to be a Matt off, Reeves trilogy. You know, that I'm assuming, obviously, the second one's on the way. Um, I, I would hope that there's going to be a third one after that, and then that would be a really good. I, th- I think just to talk about the comparison between the two at that point. I think as a trilogy, I don't know if, if this first one is anything to go off. Yeah, I think I would end up as a trilogy because I still don't know what I prefer out of the Batman and Dark Knight. Like, I think I lean towards the Batman. I just prefer that style of storytelling. But I, I like, find it, I find it, and I like that it's a bit retro. Mm. I like that. I like that kind of retro Gotham. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I that's I think, the thing I love about Batman Begins, but we'll talk about that when Adam inevitably puts it at number one. <laughs> you don't know, we've got number two yet. We, we know, we know, Adam. <laughs> um, Ollie, you're going to kick us off your number two. Uh, my number two might be slightly surprising mm. unless you've really paid attention I mean, to all of it's all probably... of my. Rants. Six films rolled into one. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, technically. Um, I, it's one of those. I think I've mentioned this before. Um, if you have just like listened to these on a surface level, there is something you would be expecting to be number one, I think. And I've got it at number two. Oh. Because uh, my number two is the Star Wars original trilogy. Okay. Uh, it is my favorite trilogy. I will say it is my favorite, but there is a trilogy that just needs to go at number one. I've, just, just I've, already, I've already written it down, Ollie. Yeah, you know what it is from this point. <laughs> um, but the Star Wars original trilogy, people have already, you know, most of us have had the sense to already talk about it, Adam. Um, <laughs> but these are some of the most iconic films ever made. They just are. They have one of the biggest universes ever made, and it is all off the back of these films and like sure the ideas within it probably the themes within it are not original you can go back to like stuff with kurosawa you can go back to old flash gordon stuff and see all of the inspiration for these films there's nothing wholly original in there but the way that george lucas has built the star wars universe has made it probably the biggest single franchise right now don't think there's a lot that really like you could argue the mcu is like getting there like the marvel universe is getting there but like it doesn't have the scope and the size that the star wars universe has and it doesn't have the following because it's just been around for longer and there was there's um, generations there's like so them. many generations and keep in mind like there was a whole generation of people who didn't have star wars film being released so, like, between 83 and 99, there were no Star Wars films. So it was just people coming up with their own interesting ideas. And that's now considered, like, legends, which I think is a really nice touch from Disney. Of We're not discounting it completely, but we're highlighting the fact that it might not be canonically true by talking about it as stories that people have told. And, like, stories within stories, that's how big Star Wars has got. It is that big. And they have that brought some of it in, haven't they? Some of it yeah. does get pulled through. Yeah, Dave Filoni has done a fantastic job across Mando and across uh, Ahsoka of really trying to meld those two schools of thought. Of this is the legend stuff that people grew up with. This is the you know the film stuff. Trying to marry that, I think Dave Filoni has done a masterful job and. 
you think of all the you know sure it spawned some bad stuff it, you know pre the prequel films are fun but that is because we were the right age when they came out let's have it right they're not good films but i do like episode one is the top of crap that i love when we did that list because it is a terrible film and i love every second of it um boba fett's not a particularly good uh series I think, you know, you, uh, Sam and Michael have talked about how iconic a character he is and he is, and I think that series kind of did him dirty. I worry that Boba Fett is kind of like the Hulk from MCU in that he's a really good supporting character, as we saw in Mando. He was brilliant in the episodes he was in in Mando, but when you give him his own property, he, he well, just doesn't by work. By bringing Mando in, though, he's then outshined in his own series. I don't mind that. By the character they clearly care more about. No, I love Mandalorian, don't get me wrong, but they clearly like him more, the writers, because they make him better. Right, they... but he but they make him better because if Mando was better than Boba Fett, you'd have a bunch of crying Star Wars fans. I don't think like I think it's I think no, it's I mean, the outside. I world think I it. think Mando stands out better. In mm. Boba Fett, when you watched it, Mando is the more captivating character. Oh, even in Boba Fett. Right, I see what you mean. Yeah. So just... they let him outshine him in his own series. And yeah, I think and it's that's well, a problem. Yeah, 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 he is a better character though. Like it's just that Boba Fett had a really cool set of armor when he first appeared in Empire. But Empire, for anyone who's listened long enough, they know that Empire is my favorite film ever. And it's because it's the beginning of all this. And it's because it's like there's just not a wasted scene in there. I do understand the complaints about um, like Return of the Jedi. It is the weakest of the trilogy, but it's by default. You've got A New Hope is literally like um, AFI top of all time in the vault for safety, for pres- you know, for preservation of culture. Um, Empire is the best sequel of all time. <laughs> Fight me. I don't care. Uh, and it gives us like that iconic I am your father moment. And Return of the Jedi doesn't quite have that. It is this weird, I've talked about it before, like the, like the first half of the film is them going to Jabba's place to save Han, and then the second half is this raid on the Death Star. And I've heard a, I've heard a suggestion that you could have easily combined those two. You could have had it where they go and save Han, but instead of killing all of Jabba's guys, they actually convince Jabba's guys, like Luke, Rather than fighting his way through, he like actually talks to them. Is like, you know, the empire is no good for you. Why don't you help us fight them? And you know that, and you know, we'll find a way to pay you back for what Han owes you. And then instead of the Ewoks, which I know is another complaint that people have, instead of the Ewoks, you have this criminal gang helping fight um, the empire, and that would be a nice little tying together of all the plots, plots and making it that little bit neater. But I still love the stuff between Luke Vader and the Emperor. I love those scenes. They're fantastic. There's, you know, Mark Hamill's really acting well in it. Ian McDiarmid is having the time of his life as the Emperor. Um, And those scenes are incredible. And, like, Luke just, you know... And, you know, for all the people crying that Luke breaks in um, Last Jedi, he also breaks in this. And he breaks way worse, because he starts wailing on Vader until he just tops one of his hands off. So, yeah, Luke Skywalker can break. But, yeah, some of the most iconic films ever made, some of my favourite films ever made, still not the best trilogy, though. Well, yeah, it's not, yeah. It's it's not, but there there is only one that yeah. is better. Uh, right, my number two, already been mentioned by Ollie, uh, mentioned in Michael's Honorable Mentions, arguably my most consistent trilogy on the list. It's Rise, Dawn and War, Planet of the Apes. Why like, are they so good? In terms of like quality, of the highest quality, mm. and like I think I think the the one that I prefer the least would be Rise. Um, mm. I think you can look at it and understand that it's trying to find its feet and it's trying to figure out where it's going to go. But then as soon as Dawn came out, and I've seen Dawn a good few times now, it just blew me away. And then War was like this massively underrated film that came out in 2017 where it just didn't get mentioned in the same scope as everything else that came out in that year. Um, And they're just, again, like I say, they're so consistent. I'm intrigued to see what happens with Kingdom, although I do feel like this three, this sort of Caesar trilogy is going to be where it peaks. Um, But I'm still going to go and watch Kingdom. I'm still going to go and enjoy it. 
Uh, but yeah, that's my number two. Don't really have much else to say on that. Um, Michael, your number two. Might be contentious. This might be. You might consider me to only have nine, because I'm aware there is a prequel to this. Oh, I. Um, but it, it's crap. Uh, Hannibal Lecter trilogy. So Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal. Well, Red Dragon, Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal. Uh, no, I know Hannibal Rising exists. It shouldn't. It does. And that that is. We have to live with that now. But. It is, and I get it, it's just because, like, Anthony Hopkins is so good at Hannibal and the films themselves, though, to be fair, like, they all have really good, like, Edward Norton's pretty good in Red Dragon, um, you know, um, and I think they're all very different films. It's not one consistent story. It's kind of like three things that happened around this one guy, but they've all got moments that are, like, fantastic you know, like Clarice hiding from Buffalo Bill is like mm. absolutely terrifying. There's so much tension in that scene. And, and Buffalo Bill is just a horrifying character, you know, and I think, you know, and again, Hannibal himself is just so iconic and mm. has absolutely always been one of those characters where, and you may, this may bring back to something, may reveal something I mentioned about the next podcast, about he's just so good at being like, although he is very clearly a very bad man, you can't help but kind of root for him a little bit. He's so charming, Even though isn't he's, he? he's literally eating people in front of you, and mm. you're like, yeah, but I don't think he'd eat me. Yeah, <laughs> you, know? you, ate, you eat Ray Liotta's head. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I just, I think, like, I would watch them again and again and again, and I would enjoy them every time. Like See, so I, I know there's that fault, but we're going to ignore it. I love, I love Science of the Lambs. It's I so good. Science it was one Lambs. of those films that I'd, obviously I'd come to late, um, but it was one of those films that everyone puts on a pedestal and everyone sort of says, oh, this is one of the greatest films of all time. And I was hesitant going into it, thinking it was going to be one of those films that I watch it and go, oh, it was all right. But I watched it and was like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. Like, it really is that like, good. It's like the same way when I watched Jaws. Like I watched Jaws for the first time, like not last year, the year before, and it was like, all right, okay, I get it. Um, I I like Red Dragon. I hate Hannibal. Hannibal um, is the weaker one because yeah. they shouldn't have let him out. It should always be him as part of someone else's story. I think he does really well there. That is what happens like in the book. Hands. To be fair, they are they are just being accurate to what happened in the book. Oh, yeah, they are, yeah, yeah. Um. um I tell you what's a weird one to do though. If you've got if you've watched Red Dragon recently and then watched season three of the TV show, there's a lot of stuff that is exactly like shot for shot. Like the yeah. guy it, tied to a chair on on fire going down into the car. Pretty park. lounge, yeah. Yeah. Um so it's really But it's been done it's been done before then as well, because everyone overlooks oh, Manhunter. Manhunter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manhunter, which is yeah. unbelievable. I prefer yeah. I way prefer Manhunter to um to Red Dragon, even though we've not got Anthony Hopkins, because I actually find it distracting how old Anthony Hopkins is mm. in Red Dragon, because I know it's a prequel because I've read the books, um, and I I don't like Ed Norton as Will Graham. I don't like him. Ed, like, as, as Will he, Graham goes, Hugh Dancy was better. Hugh Dancy's unbelievable. I do still I've still got a soft spot for Will Peterson though. Yeah, yeah. Will Peterson just took like Hugh Dancy. It, it fits the vibe they're going for. He's a little too dead inside. Hugh Dancy, mm. like Will Graham, is capable of feeling that emotion. He's just capable of some really dark stuff as well. And you really get that sense with Will Peterson. Like he is a guy living properly on the edge. And like Holly's talked to death about how she hates those kind of characters, but in his defense. Uh, uh, Will Graham was one of the first characters to really do that, to be like, I can think like the killers. Um, yeah. And Brian Cox is a very good Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those performances they get overshadowed by the fact that someone has done it the same role in a way more iconic way later. But he's really good as Hannibal Lecter. He's a lot more smarmy, and because of the plot of Red Dragon, he's a lot more antagonistic. To with, like, because obviously with Clarice, there's that kind of back and forth energy between them, and it would have been interesting to see how he did that. But yeah, yeah. Silence of the Lambs, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not fair. Uh, I love Gary Oldman as Mason Verger, though. He's incredible as Mason Verger. <laughs> is it not? 
Um, number two, Sam. Well, number two. Let me just pull it up here. So number two is already been mentioned in someone's list. It's definitely not been mentioned in your list, Adam. <laughs> but for me, and yeah, definitely, you won't agree, none of yours, but the new Star Wars is my number two. Wow. Love every single one of them is great. Um, Ollie, I've listened to you talk about Rise of Skywalker a lot of, on the podcast over the past couple of months, and I feel like your argument for why they got number three wrong is also kind of the counter-argument of why people don't like number two. Like, they're both very similar arguments. It's like number two was written by Ryan Johnson and kind of went down that direction of where he wanted to go down. Obviously, JJ left some kind of things in number one that maybe you shouldn't have left, but then, obviously, then it didn't get as, as love as Disney would hope from its fans, but you can't please everyone. Like you've said, there's like so many people out there who's loved the original Star Wars, not had anything to do since 1983, made up their own versions of what these films should be like in their head. That Them films haven't come to tuition, and then we got what we got, and I think what we got was outstanding. Um, I feel like I really, really love the Last Jedi, like you, I think it's a, it's a really, really good film. But I think what of what they did with Number Three was equally just as good. I feel like we they could have went down certain different ways, but the fans, the fans, I suppose, didn't like what they did in Number Two, so therefore they tried to steer Number Three in the way that they wanted to steer it, and they could never win in any situation. They could never win. In what I just situation. wish I just wish they doubled down. I wish they'd had the courage of the convictions to go through with the stuff that they were trying to hint at in The Last Jedi. That's been my argument. If they kind of doubled down on the idea that Ray was a nobody and it actually doesn't matter, you don't need to have come from you don't need to because everyone was like, Oh, is she a Skywalker? Is she a Kenobi? Is she a whatever? If they just had the balls to go. She's none of them because it doesn't matter. You didn't care who Luke Skywalker's dad was. Like, you, there wasn't this big mystery as to who the Emperor was in the original films. He was just the Emperor. He was just a bad guy. Yeah. There wasn't well, that need to tie everything together and have everything mean something, I guess. I, I suppose through number one, two, and three, you see how the Empire, Emperor kind of rose to kind of think. And I suppose, like, in, num in number nine, I suppose the argument is, like, he is that kind of overarching thing that links all the films together. In that sense, is that he's been there from the very beginning? Um, yeah, but it, it, but again, like there's just that line of somehow Palpatine returned. A screenwriter got paid yeah, exactly. to write that line. But what else do you want them to say? Because that's just a throw, that's just a comment by Poe in the cave, isn't it? Of like somehow he's returned. Like, but, what, but like, like they, they don't know how he's returned. What do you want Poe to know how he's returned? Because well, we can them... as the audience, they can show us. Yeah, I we can know things about that trilogy. Have, that's okay. I wanted them to have mapped out that trilogy. If you were going to have Palpatine return in that third film, which I don't have a problem with, show the hints from the beginning. Show how yeah. it was made possible. Snoke should have at some point been taken an order from someone. Mm. At some point, Snoke should have no idea, no voice, but him going, it will be done or something. Just well, that obviously small, at that time, he wasn't going to be the hinted. person who was going to be the overarching villain, was it? True, but that's, no, that's the book because like, it's like, like surprise, pep team. But what, yeah. what but the kind of nod of what they do to it, I think they work what they had to work with, they work with well. I think like Oh, Ian McDiamond does a fantastic job with what he's given. I'm not doubting that. Ian McDiamond is one of my like most of the films he is in in Star Wars are bad. There's only right. one film that I will defend really for the quality that he is in, and that's Return of the Jedi. He is a lot of fun in whatever he, he's in, but it just like it felt I know Adam is a fan of fan service, and I think fan service has its place, but fan service done right was Force Awakens. That's fan service done right. Yeah. That's really good. I think we can both agree that is a stunning film. That made me feel, like I said, mm -hmm. like I imagine people felt in 1977, and I know that that's Adam's favourite Star Wars film, and I get that. I heard, like It's never going to be mine, but I do get that. That's why it's his favourite. This felt like your fan service except a lot of the fans just ended up annoyed because it was like well you've about turned on everything and it's one criticism i have of return of the jedi is they try and retcon it because luke actually asks why didn't you tell me that vader was my dad there's a version of the script out there where yoda and obi-wan 
admit to lying to Luke about it. And that would have been so good. But we didn't get that. We got some nonsense about, oh, what I told you was true from a certain point of view. And they bleeding did it again in this. Yeah. Oh, you were nobody because you didn't know where you came from because you're actually a Palpatine. Oh, oh but like, I, I, I it is an emotion. Well. I, I think like there's lots of nods. There's lots of like, obviously, we don't find out what who Finn really is. Like, yeah. He like, just got abandoned. He was a really nice interesting thing, character, again, and he clearly, got abandoned. He clearly got forced. He's got clearly got some kind of force in him because he, he feels when people die in the force, he, he feels it. Mm. He nods to it. He obviously wants to say it. He doesn't say it when he's getting like dragged down in the sand. Um, it, it's it's just a great it's just a great trilogy, I suppose. Very much like of how I felt in '96 when I was watching the original ones. This kind of brought all them kind of emotions back, and I think that's why for me it's just in it, it for emotional states. It's just pips number one, just because it, it brings them emotions back. Mm. Yeah, I get, I get that. It's just, like, you, you're you talking about Finn's character there. Imagine if he had showed up to fight the Emperor as well at the end. That would have been quite a nice little moment. If you're Because I agree, he probably did have some force in him, but they abandoned that storyline for some reason. It just doesn't feel as mad. Like, I, I do love it. I've got it on my list, obviously. It just didn't feel as mapped out, which I know is a bit hypocritical because they clearly didn't mean for Luke and Leia to be brother and sister because she lays one on him, which is a bit inappropriate for her sister to lay onto a brother. But, I had, yeah, I do love the first two. I, like, it's on your list. I'm happy it's on your list. <laughs> um, right. If I'm making a bold prediction of what everyone's <laughs> number one is, I'm going to assume that Ollie and Michael's joint number one is the Lord of the Rings. And I'm going to assume that mine and Sam's is the Dark Knight. <laughs> there you go. Right. That was nice. <laughs> um, right, Ollie and Michael, then. If you want to talk about why you've put Lord of the Rings at number one, and then I and Sam can wax lyrical about the Dark Knight. Because it's the right answer. It's objectively the greatest trilogy of all time. Like, no set of free films is A, that high quality, and B, that consistent. And that, and... like, because it's the first set of books I read, and I read Harry Potter not long after it. And I remember watching the Harry Potter films being like, oh, I don't like how different this is. And I like them for their own thing now, don't get me wrong. Mm. But the Lord of the Rings film is like, this is exactly what I pictured. This is as epic as I thought this story was. The Balrog is as big and intimidating as I thought he was. You know, Viggo Mortensen as Strider and then Aragorn is, he is that character. He just yeah. lives and breathes it. There's not a single, um, there's not a single dud cast in this. Everyone is cast perfectly, perfectly. down to the yeah. orcs in the background. Like yeah. one of my favourite characters, because I have just... I remember laughing because Adam was like, oh, who's got time for the extended editions? Me. I have just finished last night watching all of the extended editions. Me and George you don't have kids. And watch them. That's not my fault. It's not my <laughs> fault that we, you know, wrap the tent, wrap the gent with a tent. It's not my fault. <laughs> but, um... Like... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but, the, like, honestly, like... Gorebag. Michael, like, I'm assuming you know who I mean when I'm talking about Gorebag. Because you strike me as one of those guys who knows all the background characters. <laughs> I'll be honest, I think so. But So in Return of the King, do you remember that that orc who is just putting way too much effort into his book? So it's after so after Shelob has like stung Frodo and then Sam hides. Oh, in the tower. Yeah, and there's a guy who's like, looks like Shelob's had a bit of fun. Like that guy, and he drop kicks another orc out the window. He's what, like, he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. But like, just everyone is perfectly, perfectly cast. The differences as well, because I've not read the books, but I know that there's enough differences between the film and the books. The fact that Lord of the Rings fans, who are some of the most discerning fans out there, especially the ones that have read everything in the Silmarillion, they are happy with the films. I think they accept that they are dumbed down versions of all of the law, but they accept that it, that it needs to be. You can't include everything in the Sil Silmarillion in there. And you can tell from that that Peter Jackson is just as much of a fan of the books as 
the people who would have come to see this. And it is mad that you take, like, I think we talked about it with like Dungeons and Dragons and um, World of Warcraft. It is risky to make a fantasy series like that because really you're only going to appeal to the fans of that series. Not with this. Everybody, everybody, like everybody is willing to watch Lord of the Rings. And people say like, oh, Return of the King is the worst one. And it's like, yeah, but it's like a 92% when the other two are like 97, 98, 99 or 100. The issue about Return of the King having too many endings, the thing that hurts me the most is that they killed Saruman off when they did. So we don't get his ending from the books, which in which he dies the same way, but in the Shire. Yeah. While they're defeating Sauron, he goes and conquers and enslaves the Shire. Yeah. So that vision Frodo has in Gladriel's bowl, that happens, that does come to pass. Which makes you think, like, like, go back. It makes you think that they had that ready. And that's what I mean, yes. Yeah, so I feel yeah. like they were going to do it, and then for yeah. some reason, because Christopher Lee absolutely ate that in that role. He was mm. just so... Well, he I mean, knew Tolkien. Was. He knew Tolkien. Exactly. He was yeah. friends with and him. And the whole, like... When he gets stabbed in the back, Peter Jackson wanted him to scream. And he was like, no, that's not the sound people make. And he's like, hey, do you know? And he's like, because I've stabbed people in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, I'm like, you know, because obviously he was, he's the character James Bond is based. He's the guy that James yeah, Ian Bond Fleming, is based he was friends on. with Ian Fleming as well. And Ian Fleming yeah, wanted you know, him to play Bond. He's, exactly. He's just such an iconic guy. So, so to have him fulfill his villain arc, of going and, you know, reaping the Shire and become, and then the Hobbits coming back as victorious heroes. But instead they go back in kind of the way Bilbo does, mm. where no one in the Shire knows how good they are. Mm. And I in the least... book ending, they kind of, they come back as conquering heroes and they save everyone. Yeah. I miss that. Uh, yeah, but I'd, it was even worse in the theatrical cut where they were just like, yeah, Saruman has no power anymore. It's like, yeah. It's not like we have a history of leaving villains not completely destroyed and then coming back to bite us on the arse however many years later. Like, that's that's not a thing. Um, Adam's <laughs> already mentioned Helm's Deep, one of the best set pieces ever. To this day, yeah. it is unbelievable. I mean, um, who else is going to get 10,000 extras, a unique set of armour, to be mm. in the background? of? No, no one else is going to care that much. Yeah, including... this is like when the Battle of Winterfell was supposed to be better. I was like, no, it's not. No, Even before it's not. it came out, yeah, it was like, of course it's not. Including that one guy who was just a random biker in New Zealand that Peter Jackson found in like a coffee shop, and he had one eye. And Peter Jackson thought, oh, it'd be cool to have a guy with one eye in the film. Do you want to be in a film? And he gets like a close-up shot of his missing, like just an empty eye hole, and it's just like that's so cool. It's unnecessarily cool. <laughs> Gollum. And the arc in number three that is just Harvey Weinstein. It's like, you've really annoyed me, so I'm going to make you a really ugly arc. Is that the one who doesn't have a nose and he's like sniffing him out in the extended edition? Or No, it's the big the big commander of the um, Oh, the one who's like... With the big, like, the, like, deformed face. Yeah. The one who's playing... And if you put him next played... to it, if you put him side by side, yeah. pictures, you're like, yeah, that is definitely him. Yeah, you forget that these are Weinstein productions, actually, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that's the icky bit about them. Yeah, but I think that that's the thing in Lord of the Rings, the good guys are good guys. Yeah. There's no there's no like, oh this bad guy's got ready. It's like no, the bad guys are evil. Yeah. And the good guys are good guys. The heroes are it, heroes. And people people lambast it for being that simplistic, but that's the point. These these are like legends. Tolkien's basing this off of like there's a lot of Christian iconography in there. It's you know, hearkening back to he the need for heroes and the need for gods amongst men when he was fighting in World War One, And, like, they are just, like, we don't get epic fantasy. Any epic fantasy, be it Star Wars, be it Game of Thrones, be it The Witcher, all of this owes everything to Lord of the Rings. And these films are just the perfect love letter to it. And, like, Gollum, do you think, like... I don't think that um, Tolkien necessarily envisaged Gollum as this like poster child for like horrific mental health issues as he as he was. But that scene, that first scene, where it's apparent that Gollum and Smeagol are just two different personalities because he's that broken and lonely, and the, like the camera cuts back and forth. I remember watching that as a kid and thinking, "Oh my god!" It's so this, well done. And to this day, 
it is disgraceful that Andy Serkis was not given any real kind of award. And also, Andy Serkis as Gollum, Serkis, Serkis as Gollum, is the reason we got him as in Planet of the Apes. Yeah. It was, yes, we can do compelling mocap characters. Let's do that here as that's well. Still, and let's get the guy who did it. That still look good 20 years later. Like the effects in that film still look fantastic. There's the odd little bit of jankiness. But for a film that's 20 years old, or a series of films that are about 20 years old at this point, it still looks unbelievable. It still looks better than a lot of modern films. I'm just looking at Adam's face, knowing that he's got to justify the Dark Knight as passionately in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't understand how you've got this in your top as number one, but no, one of you is putting kind of the Hobbit anywhere, not even an honorable mention to the Hobbit. Like, because no, it's terrible. Because it. they're terrible. It, it's terrible, a like, even, not even the audience, 20 the audience page book. there in terms I, of the I, I, the I'm with you, Sam, in that I think, I think Desolation of Smaug is a really, really good film. He's um, so stretched. And it was it was on my honourable mentions of the top ten sequels that we did, which like butter scrapes missed. over too much bread. To quote and a then, very wise Hobbit, Five Armies was all right. I, I, unexpected Journey went on too long, you know. Um, but I, it see, wouldn't see all these list. things you've just said. That's why it's not on yeah. the list. The, the effects don't look as good. The films are more rushed. and because you have to compare it to Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You can't not you can't look at it in a vacuum and go, oh, that's a really fun film because they are really fun films. But like, it's just there's just stuff in there that doesn't make, and that because Lord of the Rings makes so much sense, it's so true to source as it can be, and it's executed so well for the Hobbit to just take no, like, what is it like a third of the size of one of the Lord of the Rings books. Stretched out, and you know they get stuff from the Silmarillion, and they chuck Legolas in for some reason. You mm. might know we know why they chucked him in, but it's just not as good. And it is no, fun. It's as good. But I would say this: I have never rewatched. I watched them all once, and I have never rewatched them, and I probably never will. And I have rewatched the Lord of the Rings extended editions at least once a year. Yeah, since I've had access to them. Like the the, the Hobbit films for me of what the Star Wars prequels are to the OG Star Wars films. If I had been young enough, if I had been about seven when The Hobbit came out, I would probably love it because it's like all singing, all dancing, lots of funny effects, lots of funny things with the dwarves and stuff like that. But like the practical effect usage is way down. The effects and for it, the effects just somehow look worse. It looks like a worse film visually than these films that are much, much older because the older films, like Michael said, everyone's got like unique armor sets. Everyone's got like their own kind of chipped swords and stuff like that. Everyone's got their own, like it feels like a really lived in world. Whereas a lot of the scenes in the Hobbit films look like at best PS3 cutscenes. Like that's it. Like that, they just look like cutscenes from like, an okay PS3 game. Like, you don't... And, and the Battle of Five Armies isn't as good as any of the battles in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Pelennor Field is better. Um, I mean, I guess it's probably... Actually, I tell you what, it's probably better than the Attack on the Black Gate. Yeah, but um, the Attack on the Black Gate is just a diversion. It's a, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but that's the... That's the climax of that. Was that yeah? The attack on the Black Gate is just a diversion for the real battle going on miles away. Whereas the Battle of the Five Armies, that's what the Hobbits are leading up to. That and it's just a bunch of characters that I don't care about because like my, I don't like the Hobbit either. Like I've read it and it's just like, I just it's just a lot of oh and there's this dwarf. Oh, do you remember which one this dwarf is? No, because you've got about twelve of them for some reason. Like. Well, at least with the Fellowship, everyone has a very distinct personality. Whereas with the group of dwarves, it's just like, I can't, I'm, you know, at the risk of sounding incredibly racist, I can't tell you guys apart. There's nothing real. Other than Thorin, there's nothing to tell you guys apart, really. One of them's Billy Connolly. He turns One of them is Billy Connolly. I'll tell you what as well, <laughs> I watched, I can't remember what the context of it was, but before I went to secondary school, I watched a stage show of The Hobbit 
and that was better than the films. Like the effects in that were better, the costuming was better. Like I just believed that way more than I believed the films. The films just did absolutely. They felt soulless. They just didn't feel like they had anything behind them. Whereas at least, like if I make the comparison to the prequel trilogy of Star Wars, there is misguided vision there. There is a mis like that is just George Lucas not having anyone to like creatively challenge him. And I actually weirdly kind of respect that, that he has enough money to be like, this is my film, screw you. I do respect that. Whereas I just got nothing from the Hobbit films. Like they just did nothing for me. Like none of the casting moved me. Getting Gand like Gandalf, you know, Ian McKellen crying on set. That's enough to put me off the films because it's like this isn't acting. <laughs> I didn't get into acting to do this, and like Christopher Lee was too ill, so they had to film him in London. Bless him. Hey, but Batman's good, isn't it, Sam? Yeah, Batman is good, yeah. Right, I will say Batman is good. I had it low, and I deliberately didn't say anything because we I knew we were going to talk Batman at this point, and that was my concession. So, right. <laughs> I will. I concede that. I and I've said this already, that I think Planet of the Apes is my most consistent trilogy, mm -hmm. right? In that it's doing one very particular thing and it's following it through all, all the way through. No one says in interviews that his plan for Batman always was a trilogy, always was a trilogy plan. I go against that a bit because, to me, I would have loved there have to have been a smattering of League of Shadows in the Dark Knight. Because yeah. it feels like we start with Begins and we start with Raz al Ghul and all that kind of stuff and we have the grand ending and it destroys Gotham and it changes everything. But then throughout all of The Dark Knight, it's purely a Joker film, right? And then all of a sudden when we get to Rises, it's we're going back to the League of Shadows again. And mm -hmm. I just wish there was something in Same there in though, the second one. We changed the plan because Heath Ledger died. Like, he can't go, this guy died, so we changed. Because he was definitely, he was definitely going to be well, in that sequel. But then the other thing that I've heard of that is, apparently the plan for Joker in the third one is that he'd literally just be a cameo in the, when like Bane's Scarecrow wrecking is. through the city. I think they've just got to say that, though. I think they... I possibly, think yeah. That yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, it's it's no sort of surprise to anybody who's followed the podcast and listens to the podcast. Dark Knight is my favourite film. And... I think nothing tops it. Nothing has beaten it. Nothing in terms of a superhero film has gotten anywhere close to it. I think it's it works because fundamentally Batman is a character, but he's not he's not positioned as a superhero in that film. He's not positioned mm. as a he needs to be massively stronger than everybody else in order to win this. It's a crime film. It's heat. It's heat with Batman is what it is. And it works so well because of everything that no one's took the influence from and, and brought to it. Batman Begins is, like Mark Kermode says this, he, he thinks Batman Begins is an art film that they've just given a big budget to. And it just so happens to have Batman in it. And mm. Gotham in Begins looks so dingy and dirty. But then, that, no, I love no, that. no it, but it, that's very similar to Reeves' Batman. Yeah, that's my the own aesthetic real of it is very of similar. The Dark Knight is that you lose the personality of Gotham because it becomes it becomes gentrified. It becomes the sort of the the bog standard city. Yeah, you know? um, and then Rises. I think Rises gets an awful lot of flack. Right, and for stupid reasons, because Ollie, you always go back to the stock market issue. I, I couldn't care less about stock markets. So, all right. So, to so to make it less specific and like ADHD focusing on one little thing, I think my problem with writing is that there's too many little things like that. I just, especially for a Nolan film and what we come to expect from a Nolan film, I really don't think the writing is as tight as it could be. In okay. Dark Knight Rises, I think there is a very good film in there, but I think it could have done with a bit more script drafting. I do wonder that makes about sense. Script now, yeah. Now that you've said it, because I'm sure, I'm sure someone dropped off the script for the third one. So the screenplay is Jonathan and Christopher Nolan. The story is Christopher Nolan and David S. Goya. So David S. Goya didn't have anything to do with the script for the second one, hmm. but I'm sure. Like, the story the in and of itself is really different. good. The idea of Bane coming in, I like them linking Bane in with the League of Shadows and, 
you know, that fight in the, like, sewer hideout between him and Batman is brutal, and I love it. But, like, it just, yeah, the... It just, it doesn't feel that tight. There's too many little things that I feel I can poke holes in, which just... And if it was if it was anyone else's... If it was a Marvel film, I could probably forgive it. It's, like I said, because it's Christopher Nolan, I, in my own head... I have higher expectations for him. I feel like his script should be quite a bit tighter. And like, there should be less loose plot threads that you can kind of pick at than there are in Dark Knight Rises. I'm not suggest like, I probably have overegged it. It is not a bad film, but I, like compared to Dark Knight, I know Michael disagrees. I know Dark Knight Rises, is, isn't, it, isn't it your favorite? Like- And Batman Begins are on, for me, they're the two better ones. Yeah. I don't know which one I like more. Yeah, I whereas I am firmly... Batman more often. I am firmly like Dark Knight is the best, and it is... I, I am inclined to agree with Adam. It still remains one of the best comic book films ever made. I'm a bit more swung by the Batman than I think Adam is, but... I mean, I love it. I, I, the Batman's great, um, but... I feel like it's I mean... the only thing as well, like, to give it credit, it's the only thing that you've had to think about it at all. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, like Batman me... versus Superman, that wasn't even a question. That yeah, was that just... wasn't close. But, no. um, but like, yeah, it is just, especially after Dark Knight and how good the writing in that was and how focused it seemed and how tight it was. It just feels a little bit more scattergun and like a lot, like it feels like a bit less care was put into making Dark Knight Rises. Like there's a lot of silly little mistakes, like, you know, uh, film extras. You would have preferred Rises to go on as long as Return of the King, just so that we could have wrapped all the stories up. No, I'm not even saying that there's like too many loose threads. It just, I I feel like it was like, it, it was a bit sloppy in its execution. Like, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll just say they did this. You know what I mean? Like, it feels a little bit less cared for than Dark Knight does. Okay. Like... It would be uh, good uh, to know uh, how his knee magically heals. I know he gets a brace, but... Yeah, exactly. And how, he, knee- how he teleports from the Middle East to Gotham. He's yeah. Batman. You know, in an afternoon. Yeah. And he, like- he is Batman. And I get we could... But then... I don't, I don't, don't be wrong. I think there's similar problems. In the, and I've said this before. With the, the Dark Knight's got so many things that had to happen exactly that way that nobody could have predicted. And then you've got the Joker going, I'm an agent of chaos. It's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're the most meticulously planned person to ever be on TV. Yeah. It's insane how well thought out these plans are. Yeah. I think that's, you can interpret that as the point of it, though, to be fair. Like, because everyone's like, oh, you could have let Harvey Dent kill him. But when you look at it, he's got his thumb on the the, um, hammer of the gun. So if Harvey Dent pulled that trigger because he flipped to kill him, the hammer wouldn't have hit the bullet and he wouldn't have died. So there's little things like that that make you think maybe he is actually just lying about being an agent of chaos and he's just he's doing the thing that the Joker does of making his backstory deliberately vague and just lying to everyone. Yeah, potentially. You can argue that. But I do agree, like, he does have a... Like, he's, he's one of those, like, soothsayers who can see the most likely outcome in future. That's the only way to explain how he can do what he does. And in the Nolan universe, that doesn't make sense. But... I am just captivated enough by the Joker's performance to be like, yeah, cool. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Whereas all and, they like, had to do though was show like six backup plans. You know, like for example, you know, when the warehouse, but let's say they disarm the bomb, a guy on the roof of a rocket launcher just in case. Yeah. You know, little things like that would have made it so he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's just made sure that something will happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I yeah. would have gone, oh, I, I buy it now. But I don't know the thing, little things for you that I can ignore. And I get I'm being um, hypocritical. I can <laughs> ignore certain things in Dark Knight. But I, I don't care that he's knee magic heals. I don't actually care that he teleports because I just want him and Bane to fight again. And you don't That's actually care that the Joker's meticulous because to sort of go against you, like he's an agent of chaos. To the, he creates the chaos. That's why he's an agent of it. Yeah, it's, you can't, it's not yeah. nothing to like. Yeah, like yes, he's meticulous in what he's planned, but what he's planned creates chaos. That's why he's in. Yeah, it does. Chaos. But at the same time, I can get why it would rub people up the wrong way because, like, it does. Like the whole the Joker's whole mo is that yeah, he does have plans, but he is just there causing mayhem. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas some like Jack Nicholson's Joker, what he had no plan. He he was like he was an agent of chaos. He a, yeah, he was a guy out on a vendetta. 
You know? Yeah, exactly. But like all the little things that you've kind of pulled me up on, you know, like the stock exchange thing and like sending all the police down into the catacombs for them to get captured and stuff like that. And like the ex, like there's just so many fights where an extra who has Batman and Catwoman nowhere near them just flailing back like they've been hit. That's what I mean when it's when I say it feels See, a bit but it's, sloppy. It's that stuff that I think on the first time that you were watching that, you didn't notice that. Right, but again, it, it's it's it, the afterwards it, when people have picked it apart and posted it online, sure, the memes like, and all that. But it's try doing it. that with Lord of the Rings, though. Yeah, I'm sure, someone. Would be but if you do that with Lord of the Rings, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's another piece of armor I've never seen before. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't realize that that happened because he was doing that. Yeah, like the only movie goof I can think of in Lord of the Rings is that you know that bit where um, Aomer is saying, "Look for your friends, but do not trust and hope. It is forsaken these lands." Like at that moment, it cuts to him and his sword is just falling out of its scabbard. And as he's saying his line, his sword has fallen out. That's the only mistake I can find in any of the films. Like, like I said, it it's just it just feels that little bit sloppy compared to like even the first one. Like the first one feels a bit tighter than Dark Knight Rises. And I think especially after the hype of Dark Knight... I do, maybe, and this is me going against my own pick here, but maybe with with Begins, that was Nolan getting his foot through the door of Warner Brothers. Yeah. In that he got, he got his foot in the door by doing insomnia for them. And then at that point, he was able to pitch his idea for Batman because he knew yeah. that he had the, the thingy. But then... He's had to work hard. He's really had to consider what it is that's going to make that film successful. He then mm. capitalizes on that with Dark Knight, and the Dark Knight did everything that it needed to be. Um, a lot of people say that Inception was sort of one of others, but present to Christopher Nolan for getting yeah, a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, but then like Inception got like nine hundred mil, so it's like, yeah. well, how was that a present, you know? Yeah. And then Rises is just the point where he's finishing his story because he has to. Because he did Inception to. come before Rises? As yeah, well. Rises was the one between. That, that see that, that that's another thing that makes me think because the the script and the story for Inception is so tight. Yeah, like you can poke holes in like the law a little bit, but that's not fair. He's come up with an interesting concept, and that's something you can poke holes in a little bit. But like Inception is so tight, and I mean, Dark if, Knight... if you think of the films on the bounce, right, of like the scripts that he's getting done. You've got Batman Begins. Like I, I'm ignoring Insomnia at that point, right? Yeah. But you've got Batman Begins, so then, the, then the Prestige, then yeah. the Dark Knight, then Inception, then the Dark Knight Rises, and then he goes on to do Interstellar. Like yeah. you're only talking like two years in between release windows there. But I just Nobody wish that on that level. I feel like Dark Knight Rises could have done with a little bit more time. I just I just wonder if it could if it could have done with a little bit more time just stewing on that writing. To make it the third, because I, I was really hyped for it. I was ready for a Bane film. I was ready for an intelligent Bane who is there to break the bat and stuff like that. And we kind of got that. It I, just I feel- think you, you got that, I would say, for about three quarters of the film. Yeah. And then when they need Talia to do the, the bomb detonation, that's when it, like, Bane, Bane got scuppered. Bane didn't yeah. get the sort of demise that he deserved and that the film set him up to do, which, you know, but it's like every time I every time I'm saying a negative, my head's then going, but Return of the King is too long. <laughs> but Return of the King is this. It's because I feel like I'm having to justify it. But at the end of the day, we are I was gonna say four people, but Sam is being his stoic self and not really saying <laughs> um with with three people who are arguing films that we all like and yeah. we all know are good just to say which one's better. So Yeah. I just try, I I'm just trying to agree my position because at the end of the day, I, I get why Dark Knight is a lot of people's favourite trilogy. I like that's not a contentious opinion from anyone. For that to be your favourite makes a lot of sense. In the same way that, you know, if someone told me because all I would say is that I was able to be a bit more subjective and put what I thought was the best I was about to say that, yeah. Like I was able to be like, look, this is my favorite, but this is actually the best. Yeah, Star Wars is my favorite trilogy, like because it's had way more of an impact on my life. Like I watch it a lot more than Lord of the Rings, just by virtue of you can because they're shorter. <laughs> like, yeah, me yeah, and Sam I... are going to get through hours twice by the time you finish your extended editions. <laughs> <so. laughs> 
like it is a full day but as a side note as well um michael hasn't watched the truest version of fellowship though i doubt unless he actually has in which case bravo because there is someone who has painstakingly edited uh fellowship of the ring where every time sam takes a step he then says if I take one more step, it'll be the furthest I've ever been from It's home. like 15 hours long as well. It's so <laughs> good. I mean, I obviously yeah. haven't actually sat and watched it. So every, but it's every, such a funny concept. Imagine that ad. Every time a character takes a step. So there's like action sequences completely broken. For and me. like Sam said, it is just a long walk. Yeah. <laughs> oh my so God. Like every step really of that walk, walk is that scene. Every like we'll be in a cave and we're step, back in that I take one more step. It'll be the furthest I've ever been away. And I would love to know if they've actually took the map into account. Of like, so when they try and go over the Misty Mountains, is it then the same distance when they try and go through Moria, or have they doubled back on themselves a little bit? Who cares, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Who cares? That's the truest version. Imagine carrying that on through the rest of them as well. No, no. <laughs> right. Anything you want to add, Sam? Not really. I, I, like I suppose, like Michael said it in the other one. Like the third one is my favorite of the three as well. Um, just. I don't just this. I feel like it. It again. I love things that tie things in. It ties everything together. Like yeah, there's no there's no nod to. I suppose the League of Shadows in number two, but I suppose that's obviously like Michael's already said. Eve Fletcher probably had a little bit of part in that. There would have probably some continuation from number three. And um, there's just that scene in number three where the the the, the, the cops are in the car and they're driving through the tunnel at the very start, and then all the lights go out. And then he turns to him and he goes, oh, you're going to see something special. I can't remember. The, yeah, that's, that's a cool scene. scene. I do like yeah. that scene. But, and then all the lights just, and it and it just, just, it just gives you chills on your arms, I suppose. And um, that's, I think it's just, it's, it's it's clearly a Christopher Nolan film. Yeah. It clearly gives nods to number two. Number two, like, it, it keeps you twisting and guessing at every little turn. And number three does the same. It, like, leaves it open. You know what I mean? We find Robin going to find the Batcave at the end. Does he die? You know what I mean? Because there's that little nod at the end where he's sat. Why didn't they just call him Tim Drake or Jason? Oh, but or... I mean, I've I've said this before. I love all that. Yeah. I love the ending of that film. Yeah. Why did they, Why do they call him Robin? That's so dumb. Because it's like... so. But it's casual fan service. Yeah. That's what no, it is. No, that's not who that's for. Like, just call him Tim. Right. An actual name of an yeah. actual Robin. No. Yeah. I do yeah, like I even, about even that. Oh, like if, naked. I do really like that. So I, I watched it with Amy, and like it, the bit where he says, "Oh, use my use my real name," and then he says, "Oh, it's Robin." Like that got a reaction out of her. But if he if, if he'd said, "Oh, Jason Todd or Tim Blake or whoever," it's or Dick Grayson. Like yeah, if he cool. turned, if, I don't think he could have been 2012 Dick, serious serious Christopher Nolan film. If he went, "Use my real name, Dick Grayson." It's not going to happen, is it? Nah, to be fair. I mean... He's the real Robin. He is the real Robin. He just is. Like... I think, I know what I will concede about The Dark Knight. I think the biggest thing, and this is going back to what I said before about Bruce Wayne and Batman, for me, the Joker's voice is Mark Hamill as the Joker. Yes. That yes. is the quintessential version of the Joker for me. And I get that it's the animated series, but every other version of him is always compared to that for me. And it might be because that's the version I saw first. Mm. So that's solidified in my psyche as this He's is got a lot more comparisons to Jack Nicholson and Mark Hamill, if I remember right. De yeah, definitely. And I think it's quite like that, isn't more. it? And yeah. I guess more people know Nicholson, especially yeah. adults, because not as many people... Because I was just young when the animated series was on. Yeah. And... Was just the perfect like when the Iron Man cartoon was on, which is why Iron Man might be why Iron Man's my favorite Avenger, because mm. I loved the Iron Man cartoon when I was younger. Mm. Um, some things just settle, and I think that probably means I do a little bit of a disservice to the Dark mm. Knight. Um, mm. But it's hard to take your personal mm. thing out of it, isn't it? Yeah, right. We're going to wrap it up, but before we do, um, we have got a definitive top ten. Um, there were enough that crossed over and what I've done is I've essentially given things points so if something was number 10 it then got one point but I've only included the ones that crossed over so like Captain America for me 
would have been like seven points or something, but because it was on no one else's list, doesn't get any points. Not even um, for an honourable mention? No, because that's okay. just too much maths. Um, <laughs> right, number 10, uh, Blade, three points on Michael and Sam's list. Nine with six points is Austin Powers on mine and Michael's list. <laughs> Eight, Evil Dead, seven points on mine yeah. and Michael's lists. Number seven with 12 points is the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy on all yeah. three of your lists and not mine. Uh, number six on Ollie and Sam's list with 12 points is the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Five, Dude. Planet of the Apes, 14, uh, 15 points for me and Ollie. Um, Pipping that one he, on 15 points too, but it was on more people's lists is the MCU Spider-Man. So that mm-hmm. was on mine, Ollie and Sam's lists. Three, the original Star Wars trilogy. 23 points, so on all three of your lists. And then the only ones that we agreed on, just pipping it to the post. Uh, so number two, Lord of the Rings, 31 points. And number one, the Dark Knight trilogy, 32 points. Because it all came to where people put it on the lists. But it's been a while since we've been able to have a bit of a joint top 10. So that's nice to do. I'm not angry with that combined list. Not bad, is it? I'm not angry with that. I get it. Right. Anything anyone wants to say before we leave? Got all the way through this without mentioning Transformers, but there you go. So, oh, bang, you, we're going to we're gonna have to do a franchise one. For another one. <laughs> do, do, do if we do greatest films one. of all times, number yeah. one there. Doesn't matter how many films, films are in it. Top 10 films are all 10 Transformers films. <laughs> <laughs> you wait for his villain list. Megatron. Megatron. <laughs> Meg, I, would not be, I genuinely would not be angry as Megatron as a cultural I phenomenon, that's Megatron a shout for a top ten. Okay. I will give okay. him that. I'll give him that. There's everyone. Maybe not Sentinel this. Prime. <laughs> yeah, but Megatron is a is a good villain. He's Megatron like is funny in it for one. Like he's a funny villain, but mm. also quite menacing. It's a, it's. A, but I think Transformers is that kind of show, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're we're recording this week. We are recording top ten villains and. Ooh. What is going to be a top 10 good performance shame about the film, which has been difficult to put together, but Holly's keen. So Holly's coming back on for that one and for the villain. She's going to have so much like period drama stuff. She's going to have so many people in just Elizabethan, Georgian and Dickensian clothing Yeah, where there's like (laughs) one standout beautiful man acting and it's a terrible plot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why we love her on these because she always throws something out there that we don't think about. Uh, She's thank the you very much for watching. Side. Yes, she is. Um, stay safe, look after each other, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>